Hi, this is who I am. Uh, I do a lot of stuff in and around open source and managing open source communities and science and research, and I'm an ex-researcher, so I will be talking a lot about open science. Um, I also do a lot of stuff in diversity, I guess is the, the generic term for it. I'm on the board for Women in Science Australia. I uh, tend to be really militant about making sure that there's a lot of different kinds of people around. Uh, moving on, um, one of the things I do is uh, I'm the outgoing co-chair for Open Knowledge Australia, which is a uh, uh, we kind of call ourselves the Department of Mucking Around and Doing Cool Things, but we're a little bit more than that now. We're actually a proper national organization with a board and a bank account and, you know, all those adult things. Uh, and we run a whole heap of things. We run a whole heap of events. We're heavily involved with GovHack, which... Uh, is there anyone here who doesn't know about GovHack? Yeah. Oh, one person. Cool. Oh, <laughs> don't lie. <laughs> Uh, we'll come to that. Um, you know what? Who remembers in the beginning was the command line? Yeah, go on. Excellent. I was really hoping at least half the room would remember. Okay, so if you haven't read it, this was a really excellent uh, essay. I'm, I'm on page one of 60, uh, fully available online, written by Neil Stevenson in 1999, and it's talking about the golden age of uh, software development and open software specifically. Uh, and... It's, it's a lot more than that. It's this massive homily to the way humans think about interactions with the world, but uh, also about the philosophical beauty of being able to not touch anything so ephemeral and yet pay actually rather a lot of money for it. Um, but the, the, the really cool thing about it is the, he was one of the first people to really give the analogies of software as something tangible. And he gives the analogy of uh, car dealerships. So, you know, you, some buyer rocks up to an intersection and there's four different car dealerships. And in one corner, there's this giant one and it's making big, clunky off-road things and SUVs and they're big station wagons and they emit terrible fumes and they break down all the time, but they're huge and everyone knows them and everyone repairs them. Uh, and then on another corner, there's this uh, place that used to do bikes and now they've uh, made this hermetically sealed, beautiful thing that's like this big, sleek, lovely thing and uh, you can pay a lot of money for it, but there's no way that you're gonna know what the inside of it looks like. That's Apple, in case you haven't guessed. The first one's Microsoft, in case you haven't guessed. Uh, and then in this other corner, there's <laughs> BOS, um, which uh, does these cool tanks. And then, and then there's like this corner that's not actually a dealership. It's just a bunch of teepees and fires and geodesic domes. And out the front, they've got a whole heap of tanks lined up. They're just making them and they, they, they keep producing them one a minute with the keys in the ignition. They're sitting on the street and they're uh, cool, and they take no fuel at all, and they will drive over everything. And, um, and you know, a buyer walks up to the corner and looks around, and most of them just go straight to the giant one. Uh, and then, they, then one of them engages in a conversation with this person who says, no, 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 you should come get one of our tanks. Uh, and he goes, but uh, that's cool, but I, like, I don't really know how to like fix it. Um, and he goes, yeah, but you don't know how to fix your SUV either, the one that you're buying from Microsoft. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, the, there's like the mechanic there and they'll come and fix it for me. He's like, don't worry about the mechanic, we'll come to your house and we'll fix it for you. And the answer is, invariably, stay away from my house, you filthy freak. <laughs> Moving right along. Uh, so, like, things have kind of changed. You know, it's no longer 1999, even though if I could, I would be wearing cargo pants right now, I assure you. Who here is wearing cargo pants? Thank you, Tim. See, leading the way, people, future-proof. Um, and if you type market share of open source into Google, you see a lot of zeros. And even if you break that down into something specific like databases or um, hardware, you still see a lot of zeros, right? So in a lot of ways, it appears like we've won the argument. Cool. All right, that's good. I'm going to come back to this. Uh, this is a plant. <laughs> um, 
So what I'm going to do now is just tell you about a whole bunch of things that are going on in open source. I'll start with open knowledge and a bunch of other things that are happening in the world, and then we'll come back to talking about the geodesic domes. Okay, so Open Knowledge Australia, we do a whole bunch of different kinds of things. I'm so tempting the demo gods by scrolling through a website live. This is terrifying. Anyway, um, uh, on... Uh, this weekend just passed, we ran what turns out to have become our biggest event. This was something that I started three years ago based on a hallway conversation. Uh, uh, I was at GovHack and I was talking to the GovHack organiser uh, and we were talking about, well, who else would actually benefit from this kind of model and who else needs a little bit of data and, and introduction to open source and what else is going on in the world? And we went, well, you know what, bench scientists? Uh, they tend to have horrific problems that they don't know how to fix because they're very good at being scientists and they tend to be terrible programmers and terrible coders uh, for really good reasons. It's because they're spending all their time being scientists. And actually a lot of them are women, a lot of them are uh, very busy stuck in a lab doing spectacular things and their workflow takes 20 years to get to anything. So started a weekend hackathon and you know three months later there was this thing going and I hadn't slept for a month and it was amazing and it was 50 people in a room and they came up with these incredible things. Like there was this data visualization of quality control of uh, genetic probes. And that was cool. Um, this year there were four sites across Australia and the Queensland Minister of Innovation rang up the Brisbane site and said, hey, I'd like to be involved. And Perth had food trucks and there were 10 different problems in Melbourne. Uh, and what I think is, is actually a particularly good metric of quality is the quality of the problems that are getting solved. So there's a whole heap of problems that were happening around Australia that were, I'm a scientist and I do this repetitive process which somebody could automate for me and it would save me four days a month or maybe four days a week. Uh, and it's a solvable problem and I know it's solvable because I have a phone and it does beautiful magical things and why can't my computer do this for me? I'm doing all this data and you know I'm spending four hours all the time messing around on Windows Paint to get my pictures to line up so I can publish them. So these are solvable problems and um, the way we run Health Hack is we actually get a problem owner, so a scientist with a problem to come and talk about it and teams assemble around them and they solve that problem over a weekend or at least they create a proof of concept. So uh, we had a bunch of those and they're great because they're solvable and you can walk away from a weekend saying I'm going to go back to the lab and I'm going to use this tomorrow. What we also had was out of the 10 problem owners just in Melbourne, which is where I was, so I'm mostly going to talk about that. Uh, there were just excellent problems in Sydney and in Brisbane and in Perth. Um, but in Melbourne, of the ten, I reckon four of them were global problems. They're the problems that everyone in this field is having and everyone's talking about all the way to the highest level, all the way up to like World Health Organization saying, we need a genome browser, we need a way to compare... Um, this particular kind of data we need, you know, and there were four of those, and all of them came up with a decent proof of concept. So, you know, I, I'm kind of happy. Um, no, thank you. Thanks. Um, GovHack, you all know about it. Uh, it's actually part of uh, Linux Australia these days, which is awesome. Uh, but we, uh, Open Knowledge tends to do a lot of stuff with it. You know, again, uh, something that started off as a few people in a room is now getting $300,000 worth of government funding. So Health Hack this year had, like, you know, the first year we ran on the smell of an oily rag and this year we had $25,000 in cash and $10,000 in in-kind and stuff. So it happens. And uh, with some people, we're again starting with the, so why would you do this? Why would anyone come and volunteer their time to solve my problem for me. It feels like, why would you clean my toilets for me, for free? Uh, and with some people, it's, yeah, we see the value of it. Here, have some cash and come do this for us. Um, it's not just making Big Bang events. Big Bang events happen 
they, they happen and they're good, but they're a weekend. And then you've got the rest of the year. So what we've been doing in Melbourne is community building. Every Wednesday night you show up to the same event and there's either a talk or it's a shut up and hack or it's a, hey, have you found this cool new technology? Can we just come and have a play? Um, and we ran a bunch of workshops leading up to GovHack and training people up to use the kind of tools that they might want to use on the weekend. Um, there's uh, let's go spend two weeks playing around with a particular data visualization tool, all this kind of thing. In Brisbane, started doing the same kind of thing. So we've got health hacky hours leading up to health hack, and it was everything from this is Git, and this is what a scientist talks about when they say these words, all the way through to I have an idea, you've got a weekend, how are you going to make it into a product? Like, what does that mean? And training and all this kind of stuff. And the effect of having ongoing touch points creates a very different kind of community to just having a couple of big bang events. Uh, and I can talk about that for a really long time, so I won't. Um, we're doing childcare at events now, which is really brilliant. Thank you. I can't tell you how proud I am. Uh, so just this weekend, the main, and it turned out to be really the only like key developer for one of the teams, for the winning, for, for one of the teams that won, um, would not have been there, like wouldn't have even considered being there if there hadn't been childcare. And all he needed was three hours on a Saturday morning while his wife was at work. So this scientist now magically has two free days a week in which to do more science uh, because we paid a couple of people with working with children's certificates to rock up. You know, it, 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 the kinds of effects that it has are really surprising sometimes. Um, oh yeah, okay, so uh, I've loaded this web page up even though <laughs> Vic Tripathon have uh, lapsed, let the domain lapse, um, uh, because I wanted to tell you about Vic Tripathon. So let's go to another web page just for now, because that's kind of ugly. Um, so other formats of doing hackathons and engaging with the community is uh, uh, the Vic Tripathon was specifically uh, to create data for. It was um, Matt. Who was it again? It was Vic. Department of Transport, wasn't it? Yeah, Department of Transport. So Department of, Tran Department of Transport Victoria uh, wanted a hackathon and what they did was actually uh, not just have a Big Bang weekend, they uh, had a Big Bang weekend where people got paid at the end of it just to participate and then they had a month of ongoing development. People get a little bit of um, further financial encouragement for having succeeded through all of those steps and then uh, actual prizes for the people who made it through all the incubation stages and actually came out with a working prototype. It's pretty cool, actually. It's been very successful. Um, bit, bit exciting to run, I'm told, but uh, actually had excellent results. Um, I'll, uh, I'll have all the links available afterwards if you're interested, but um, I'll, I, I tried to look for this on the Internet Archive and it wasn't really happening, so I've left it alone. Other things that are happening. Uh, so we do a lot of interaction with government. Everyone who does open stuff these days kind of does. Um, there's the open council data. Um, Steve Bennett mostly does that. And uh, he goes around to councils mostly in Victoria, but really all around Australia, and encourages them to make data open. It's everything from trees to garbage collections to does anyone want to, does anyone either know or want to guess what is the most popular open government data set? Sorry? Planning. Planning, you'd think, yeah? Centrelink offices. Centrelink offices? Open toilet maps, have a gold star, yeah. Yeah, any data set left on opendata.gov.au for long enough magically transforms into open toilet maps. Everyone loves them. Anyway. Um, here are the kinds of data sets we've got available. Uh, there's a whole heap of stuff. Uh, so 14 out of Victorian's 79 councils have got data that's open. One of the ways in which that's happening is Steve went and found um, this guy. Uh, no, not that guy. Where is it? What have I done with it? There's another tab here. Oh, no. Bad Maya. 
Anyway, uh, there's this guy called Steve O'Keefe, and he actually sells governments an, uh, a platform for visualizing all of their open data. And so they pay for this service. But Steve went and spoke to him and went, hey, if council's going to do this, why don't you get them to put it on data.gov.au first, and then it feeds into your website. And that worked. And so that's what they're doing now. Let me see if I can find you the website. I think it's here. Yay, ground truth. Ha, 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 ha. Totally capable of doing this. There we are. So, um, so the councils are now actually going through that uh, option. Uh, OpenEconomy.org, okay, so the Australian Greens, so this is actually Steve, now I'm just fangirling, Steve Bennett uh, goes and hangs out with Scott Ludlum occasionally and helps him redesign the Australian Greens Open Economy Project. How cool is that? Um, so they do really interesting kind of data visualizations and here I am tempting the demo gods. You can go and have a look at it in all kinds of ways. Uh, I won't actually mess around with this too much because it's liable to break and make me cry. Uh, but I really recommend going and having a look at this project. Um, open spending. So a lot of the data that goes into the open, uh, into Scott Ludlum's Open Economy Project is uh, open spending, which is actually uh, international open standards and government data from around the world around uh, how government money is spent everywhere. So tying the two of those in the back end, that's kind of nice. A little more locally in Australia, uh, Rosie Williams has created the Open Budget website, which does the same kind of thing with the Australian budget. This last year, the government finally made all this data available. It's not standard, so um, the biggest problem you have is, so it's budget night, all the journalists, everyone wants to know what's going on, where is the money actually being spent? And for years, it's just coming these bizarre PDFs and Excel spreadsheets, and you, you know what it's like. Um, this year the government's put it all online, but it's not going to look exactly the same way next year. So you can't just build like a web front end to analyze it for you and make it all beautiful. You have to do it year after year the same way. Um, Rosie started this project to try and do that, to try and normalize it so you can actually compare it pretty quickly. Um, so Rosie has been a full-time carer for a while, so she's got time on her hands and uh, she kind of decided to step away from social activism and thought she'd go and mess around with just trying to answer a question about how government spending is happening for a particular socially disadvantaged group and found herself becoming a social activist to her own surprise. Um, but, you know, this is actually a really great project and uh, she's looking to get that uh, further. She's looking for investors. She's starting to get a bit of uh, government interest in it. Interesting. Cool. Um, this is more... Um, uh, council data. This is what it looks like when councils open up data. So you can go and say, show me the vegetation zone for this place. Show me the admin facilities. This is just one council. Sorry, Victoria. It's where I live. I can tell you things about it. Here we are. It's kind of cool. Um, okay, Anne-Marie Elias. She's not in Victoria. She's in New South Wales. And she's... Uh, ministerial staff, but she went, you know what, there's all this data that's happening in various levels of government, everything from community services all the way up to federal, and none of those data sets talk to each other. That's not good enough. So she went round the back and sort of spoke to all these people and got them to connect all the stuff and did it all under the radar, and now there's a very interesting outcomes of like what where does domestic violence actually happen and how does it happen and what are the different correlations around all of that? Uh, and a lot of this, the findings from this aren't public yet, but there's echoes of it on the internet if you go looking. And if you call Anne-Marie, uh, here she is on the Twitters, but you know, if you go and find her, which it's not hard to do, you know she's a public figure, um, she'll happily tell you all about it. Very interesting results, very interesting. Um, Australia's considering uh, signing up to the Open Government Partnership. That's kind of cool. Uh, we've been talking about doing it for a while. This is something uh, that Gillard started and then he died again. Um, there was the Open Government Summit in Indonesia two years ago. Uh, and we had one representative from Australia 
who very publicly went and sent, said things like, if Mongolia can do it, where are we? Um, this is a uh, particular sort of, um, so the Open Government Partnership basically gets governments to share their own data, not just uh, together, but uh, in ways that are standard across governments. Yep. So that you can compare government to government. Why would you do that? Um, other things that are happening in the world that aren't open knowledge related, um, New Zealand does really spectacularly good things with open, you name it. Um, so, and Spiral, for example, are a group of people who do all kinds of things that are open, everything from open law to Lumio. Has anyone used Lumio? A couple of hands, yeah. It's uh, an open source tool for collective decision making. It uh, was born from the um, the Occupy movement, where there were, you know, where what happened was the biggest noise, and therefore the biggest public face was a whole heap of, well, noise. Uh, it was a whole heap of people with opinions who were essentially dirtying the water, and you couldn't actually get a word in edgewise, and you couldn't actually address topics. You could only argue with the people who would throw garbage in. So they created this beautiful online tool for um, being able to, it, it, it's effectively a self-selecting tool for information, not noise. Really excellent. Um, I highly recommend it. I also just generally recommend everything that comes out of Inspiral. Um, one of the things that came out of it was the Open Government Open Society Conference, uh, which happened uh, this year, just in April. Um, and it was, uh, by, by all accounts, excellent. And it's one of those things that uh, brings up a lot of the fresh blood of people who are doing open in places that aren't traditionally open. Uh, really recommend going and looking at that site if you want a bit more info about things that went on. Here we are. Open technology, yep. Um, oh, the, the, the Wiki New Zealand. Uh, it's, it's a really cool project. Uh, just. Uh, somebody decided that they needed to wiki everything about New Zealand and they could, so they are. Uh, among other things, it's a science communication project. Um, the Ministry for Environment New Zealand on Wednesday released 2,000 new data sets. They do this all the time. They're pretty, very interesting stuff. Uh, maybe not in France. I think they're probably in New Zealand. I don't know why this map centred on France, but moving right along. Um, the New Zealand Open Source Awards this year, uh, this is the second time they've run, and they've, uh, <clears throat> they really highlight the sorts of projects that are open, again, that wouldn't necessarily uh, you would think of as open, like business, uh, which is it was hardware, open hardware, uh, but education. They do very interesting things with uh, open education resources. Uh, the, S Open Science Award was won by the Auckland Bioengineering Institute and their attitude to all these things is why do you call it open? It's just the way science is done. Uh, so, you know, there's science and then there's closed science. Uh, their physiome project is fascinating. Uh, they, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> they, oh, sorry. Um, they created, thank you, they've created all of these models of things like human cells uh, that show electrical movements across it, and, and more than just that, also networks. Uh, and their work is open source. Everything they do is open source. They then commercialize the outputs in some ways, some of the outputs, and it's all very selective. Um, what they found is that when they take data from published research and throw it into their models, a lot of the data doesn't appear to have the same results that the publishers claim, just saying. Um, and you can go and play with it yourself using the CellML uh, project. Uh, all of their stuff is online. Um, okay, software carpentry. I'm gonna come back to software carpentry, but who here knows what it is? Yeah, cool. Uh, it's a educational framework for teaching software to researchers. And it's not just software. Uh, 
what do the people who've set this up kind of discovered is that you've got a whole heap of people who are researchers, whose job it is to create data that don't understand that what they do is create data. And so their concept of data management is, huh? You know, archaeologists who have hand-drawn maps and don't understand that there are things like tile mill these days. Like, I have no concept that you can do this, that you can go and create your own maps in any ways that you want. Um, but then the uh, software carpentry workshops teach them everything from this is the concept of data, this is the concept of data management, this is the concept of version control. Now, let's talk about things like statistical analysis. This is R, this is Python, let's do some scripting, let's move your data around. Uh, and it's uh, taken off in Australia really significantly. It's, it, it's mainly aimed at graduate and postgrad students, uh, but it's more than just that. Um, I'll come back to this. Uh, there's also the Research Bazaar, which is sort of a, it's sort of software carpentry conference festival. And there are a lot of hippies and geodesic dome type things, but then there's also, um, this is how the concept of open education has affected my life as a researcher. It's, so the concept is, you know, bringing the research from the cathedral to the bazaar, the concept of bringing, uh, and there's actually like whole books about this. Um, it's happening this coming year, not only in Melbourne, but in other places as well, also in New Zealand, which is very exciting. Um, other things that are going on in New Zealand, uh, the Creative Commons uh, uh, department um, in New Zealand are publishing a book about their development. Uh, it's crowdsourced by PledgeMe, which is the New Zealand version of crowdsourcing. Um, the AdaCamp uh, toolkit is also crowdsourced. Speaking of things that are crowdsourced, if you are holding a conference or anything like that, you can go and make it kind of awesome by uh, incorporating elements of a feminist unconference. Not necessarily, this is just a by the by, incidentally. Uh, other things that are open source and other things that are available on the internet. Cool. Um, there's now the Australasian Open Access Support Group, and they support people in becoming open access in all kinds of ways from uh, general information to legal advice. Uh, and they've now merged uh, in Australia and New Zealand, and you can do all kinds of really interesting things about that. And they're, they're full of resources. Like, if you find yourself, as we all do, sometimes being the hippie in the geodesic dome, talking to somebody about trying to convince them why it is that you want to clean their toilets for free, resources over here. Um, open science, uh, the Open Malaria, Open Source Malaria Project, uh, runs out of University of Sydney. It was started by a guy called Matt Todd. Uh, it's been running for years, and what they do, among other things, is visualize uh, molecules, and they're looking for cures for malaria. Um, they've been running for a while, and they do excellent things. Uh, very similar, um, also same person, same group of people, open source tuberculosis, again, looking for new medicines. Um, so they get students to visualize databases of molecules. They, uh, they've come very much to the conclusion that if we could keep going the way we are as a scientific community and everything takes forever, we're 20 or 30 years away from having any, you know, being able to touch TB, really, and a lot of other diseases. So we're just going to have to open this up and crowdsource it. You can go and do this. You can go get involved. Go, go contribute to the Open TB project. Um, all of their logbooks are online. All of their stuff is online. They have their meetings on the internet. Anyone can go join in. You don't have to be a scientist and you don't have to be some sort of guru coder. It helps. Um, this is the kind of stuff they do, 3D visualizing of molecules and then people get to play with them. Um, the Open Source Pharma Project has got rather a lot of money behind it these days. Again, same group of people doing a lot of open science, open research. Uh, hey, look, the Open Source Pharma is a concept inspired by the Linux model of operation. There it is. Um, so again, they're trying to do open R&D. Uh, 
Uh, okay, open source, yeah, okay. So this is a whole heap of argument about the open source farmer. If you want to find out opinions, here they are. Other things that are open. Um, okay, so these are a couple of projects that I've been working on, and I just want to mention them. This is what I do in my day job, among other things. Uh, so there's this a platform that's happened in, been around for 20 years or so called uh, the Open Source Medical Record System. It's one of the more popular ways to do medical record system that is an enterprise. It's really got a face only a mother could love. And as a clinician, it's a really difficult to use. <laughs> um, you probably wouldn't. Uh, what some people did is two and a half years ago, three years ago, is get together and go, you know what? People who are poor in developing countries need nice things too. Uh, so they started the BAMNI project, which is a front end for OpenMRS, and it incorporates not just OpenMRS, but also um, an inventory system and a laboratory management system. So now you've got a full usable by a clinician hospital management system, and it's taken them two and a half years and 40 developers, and they've done it all in the smell of an oily rag, kinda. Um, but, you know, it's now a thing. Um, one of the projects that I worked on using this was uh, an Ebola management system. Uh, here we go. So, uh, during the Ebola outbreak, which is still, in fact, happening. Uh, there are Ebola treatment centers in West Africa, and the way they work, oh God, there we go. Yeah, I'm tempting the demigods. I knew this would come back to bite me eventually. Oh no, 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 that's broken. Anyway, we'll leave it alone. So uh, the way you treat Ebola, because it's highly infectious, is you have all of your sick people in a quarantined compound and nothing comes in or out. Well, anything that goes in certainly doesn't come back out unless uh, it's going to go through enormous amounts of sterilization first. So we created a very pretty interface to be used on a tablet inside the red zone, inside the infectious area, where somebody could walk around with a tablet and say, yep, this person's got hiccups, that's lovely. Um, that is important, in fact. Uh, but here is some stuff, here is what I've captured for them. But then, there, you know, you do your 45 minutes in the heat, wrapped inside essentially a spacesuit, and then uh, you go back to your desk and you look at it in a much more complete format. So you can do some thinking about the patient. That was kind of awesome. Um, why was that important? It's important because not just poor people need nice things. We've kind of come to this point where we seem to have won in a lot of ways the ethical argument and in a lot of ways the monetary argument. You know, your washing machine runs on Linux. So do a lot of things in your life. Uh, even though you're sometimes the hippie in the geodesic dome. Um, but we've now got this, as the hippie in the geodesic dome, what we're often trying to tell people is that open is better because it's open. And it's not, actually there's this confusion that open is somehow a proxy for good, and it's not. In order to be of value, the product you're creating needs to be of high quality, needs to be of as high a quality as any of the enterprise system, as any of the closed systems. Otherwise, why bother? If I am, say, the head of a university and I'm installing a learning management system, why would I take an open source version unless I can control uh, what are the next features that are going to... I can't just rely on some volunteers. I need to know which features are going to come in next. I need to say this is going to look like this. This is what my users are going to have. As a government department, open is better by default, but only because it has all these other benefits. Um, it's this really interesting argument that, you know, open is not the same as free. And going back to the 90s, I'm talking about free as in beer. Uh, so there's all these costs that go with it. There's maintenance, there's installation, there's development, there's prettying up, there's the infrastructure, everything. It's not free, even though the software might be. So you've got to have everything as good as it can be. 
So, like Bamni, Bamni actually is a pretty damn good system, which is why OpenMRS didn't take off by itself, even though it's been around for a long time. It's used in a lot of places, but very clunkily. Now it's suddenly a thing and people are paying for it. Um, okay, so Obama's recently pledged $2 million to open education resources because, it's, because they're actually good platforms now for sharing educational resources. As a researcher, I would only publish in an open journal if it met my first two criteria of it is actually going to bring the university good reputation and, uh, you know, cost is my secondary concern and after that are my ethics. It's nice to be able to say my ethics are my primary concern, but open journals are only worth publishing in if their reputation is as good, if their peer review process is as good as other journals. As a business, that's the same thing. And here is a map of uh, some of the stuff that happened uh, at MozFest last year. Um, here is some stuff about open data and why that matters. What's come out of it is just going back one step to the open research platforms is, for example, one of the things that are happening is that uh, the University of Auckland is trying to find a way to justify introducing something like uh, software carpentry, but as an accredited part of the educational course for all students in the same way that they do things like this is where the library is, you know, so that it's got actual value. And nowadays a lot of the tools are of value. A lot of the tools are as good. A lot of them aren't. A lot of open projects, they kind of suck. Yeah, they're open and they're great, but people don't use them because they're not worth using. Semi-popular opinion number 322. Not popular, just important. Important, thank you. Not popular, just important, yeah. You know what, I'm just gonna leave it at that. Um, uh, if you wanna talk to me about any of these things, here I am with this picture of a wall of poo samples at the um, uh, Museum of Microbiology in Amsterdam, which manages somehow to be both beautiful and interesting. Wall of poo, very important. Not popular, very important. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we can do, uh, we have a few minutes if anybody, do you want to do questions? Sure. G'day. Um, do you think that whole problem of um, so, uh, open source projects ending up being pretty hacky and often looking bad is kind of a, a result of the toss it over the wall project idea where someone hacks something up for themselves and then says, okay, well, I put it up on GitHub, that should be enough for everyone and, and hopes that somehow magically open source will happen from there. The short answer is yes, people make things open and expect that the magic of open will somehow make it better. Uh, it's not that simple. Uh, making something better requires a little more effort than just making it open and creating a readme and putting it on GitHub. Uh, those are excellent places to start. Those are not the end. Uh, you've got to incorporate it, you've got to talk to other people, you've got to see the value to it, for, you know. The open budget project began as somebody just saying, I want to visualize open government spending. Uh, and it was a beautiful website that did all these gorgeous visualizations and had no context and nobody used it because it had value for one person who knew what its value was. And now it's becoming a different thing. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Tim. And thanks, Maya, for a great keynote. My question goes back to the diversity of open asterisk projects that we're seeing spring up, which in itself I think is fantastic. Do you think we're reaching peak open or peak hackathon, where we've got so many different hackathons, health hack, gov hack, Vic Tripathon, where the, the attention span uh, for developers and for data scientists to work together is actually being reduced? Do we actually need to work together to um, make sure that this area isn't saturated? That's a great question. 
And it's a real problem that we're seeing, not just uh, hackathon fatigue and open fatigue and buzzword fatigue and disruptor fatigue. Uh, we're getting to a point where there's no value in, the point of diminishing returns of extra value is kind of about here. You know, you can make a lot more things open and try a whole heap of different things, but unless we refocus and choose a few things to, to actually develop further, we're going to end up with what we've ended up with, which is a glut of things that are open on GitHub or otherwise. And uh, how do you even know where to start? And if I'm trying to find a project that does whether it's molecular modeling or something obscure in kernels, like, like where, do, where, where do I even find it? And how do I discern what's better? Like how do I discern this thing that's, uh, you know, has, that got used once but is actually excellent and with two lines I could incorporate it into my project from this thing that looks excellent because it's got a big advertising budget and everyone's talking about it, but it doesn't do anything different to what I can do myself with Excel. Uh, yeah, so th th the next point is to find the quality and to, and, and again, we, we're getting to the same problem as a race where we've got a whole heap of things and now we're trying to quantify them and qualify them and now we need metrics for qualification and for quality and how do you do that and, you know, same problems. Um, we are at morning tea time, I think, now. So everybody, please thank Maya again for a wonderful keynote. Um, we have a, a small gift for you as uh, a thank you for being wonderful.